Hermeticism is a philosophical tradition that gets its name from Hermes Trismegistus, a word which means thrice greatest Hermes. And Hermes in Greek mythology was the emissary or messenger of the gods, able to move freely between the worlds of the mortal and the divine. He was associated with the planet Mercury, as well as the Caduceus, which is the famous symbol of a winged staff intertwined with two snakes. He was the protector of thieves and the god of wisdom, as well as the equivalent in ancient Egyptian mythology to the god Thoth, scribe to the gods, accredited with inventing writing, the god of science, magic, art, among other things. So that's quite a resume. Not to mention, he was often presented as the son of Zeus, the king of the gods. Before we start, I'd like to say that when it comes to interpreting ancient mysteries, the symbols often have multiple meanings, so please keep that in mind. For example, if we look at Christianity, we can use any religion as an example if we wanted to, but let's take Christianity. Some would say that there's more to the biblical interpretation than just words, as one must understand their symbolic meanings to uncover the deeper context of what is being communicated. Christianity also consists of ideas and traditions that predate the time of Jesus Christ. For example, the Christmas tree, a symbol that was adopted from earlier traditions that existed in places like Europe and incorporated into a religion that was disseminated during the Roman Empire. There were also other elements that were incorporated into the organized religion that came from a time in remote antiquity, such as the cyclical pattern of the stars and zodiac, a subject which is called astrotheology, a word that comes from the Greek word astron, which means star, and theology, which means study of God. So it's the influence the stars have on religion. Most people are aware that December 25th was probably not the real birthday of Jesus, as few in the first two centuries of Christianity claimed any knowledge of his exact day or year of birth. And the date celebrated is more than likely the winter solstice, when the shortest day of the year, after three days, starts its yearly cycle over again and the days begin getting slightly longer until the summer solstice, or longest day of the year. The point that I want to make with this is that just because this is the case does not mean that there are no other esoteric layers of meaning to be uncovered within the symbology. It's an oversimplification to claim that it is only a reference to the sun and other celestial cycles, missing the deeper implications, ignoring the spiritual aspects, thinking it only describes the sun's cycle which incidentally can also be seen in other ancient mystery religions, such as Mithras, which is famously portrayed as the solar deity killing the bull, which represents Taurus, the transition out of the age of Taurus into the age of Aries, the Aryan age, or Hercules, who has 12 labors, where this deity battles lions, which represent the age of Leo, and so forth. It's a mistake to conclude that there's nothing more to this, insisting that the ancient people merely documented a cycle, whether it be the year, which consists of 365 days that they divided into 12 months, or what Plato calls the Great Year, which is a roughly 26,000 year cycle divided up into 12 segments of roughly 2200 years each that we call ages, such as the age of Aquarius that we're now entering. So it is the deeper esoteric or occult meaning that we will touch on today. And occult simply means hidden or secret, not bad or necessarily evil. That said, probably the most famous literature in the field of Hermeticism and attributed to Hermes or Thoth is known as the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. Whether or not the information stretches all the way back to the time of Atlantis is disputed and is mostly attributed to European Renaissance alchemy, starting towards the end of the Middle Ages. Hermes Trismegistus, however, predates that, as its first known appearance is in the book written in Arabic between the 6th and 8th centuries. And in Islamic tradition, 
Hermes Trismegistus is considered the builder of the pyramids of Giza, but may also predate writing from the Holocene altogether. One can argue that alchemy can be traced at least to ancient Egypt, which used to be called Kemet, from where we get the word alchemy. Kemet translates to black land and has nothing to do with skin color, but rather is an esoteric concept that is symbolic of the mother goddess, as everything, including light itself, is first born from blackness. If you look it up, you'll likely find explanations that speak to the fertile black soil of Egypt along the Nile. But remember, we're talking about the esoteric interpretation, and in the occult context, black is associated with goddess. Just like the black Kali goddess in India, or the Black Madonna, which the Templars introduced into Europe after their time in Jerusalem, whose civilization also has its roots in ancient Egypt. I have a video that explains this in more depth called Baphomet and Sophia, Goddess of Wisdom, which I will include a link to in the description. But let's move on now to the Emerald Tablet itself. The true original source of the Emerald Tablet is unknown, but what is known is that it is regarded as holding the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone, a legendary alchemical substance capable of turning base metals, such as mercury, into gold. Now, as I've tried to articulate earlier, religious stories often have multiple meanings, and one should not cling to the most obvious or literal interpretation. The same goes with alchemy as while I personally do subscribe to the possibility that metals might be transmuted into gold, the deeper implication here is the transmutation of substances into spiritual matter, or divine gold. Isaac Newton, who incidentally was born on December 25th, was an English mathematician, physicist, astronomer, and alchemist, and it is an excerpt from his translation of the Emerald Tablet that I will now read. Tis true without lying, certain and most true, that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to do the miracles of one only thing. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse, the father of all perfection in the whole world is here, its force or power is entire if it be converted into earth. Separate thou the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, sweetly with great industry, it ascends from the earth to the heaven, and again it descends to the earth, and receives the force of things superior and inferior. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world, and thereby all obscurity shall fly from you. Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So was the world created. From this are and do come admirable adaptations, whereof the means is here in this. Hence I am called Hermi Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. That which I have said of operation of the sun is accomplished and ended. While there is much to be said about this short passage, I will focus on what I feel are some of the key points, so let's start at the top. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to do the miracles of one only thing. As above, so below can be interpreted in many ways. For example, life down on earth mirrors celestial cycles in the heavens, which is the basis for the field of astrology, where certain energies in nature are most available at certain times following a repeating pattern, an example being the four seasons. Another way to look at this concept is that above means outer, 
as in the exterior world, and below means inner, as in the internal, subjective, or spiritual world. Next sentence. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. While our senses tell us that things are separate, literally by distance, in certain abstract disciplines like math and physics, the universe is very much interconnected and not really separate at all. So the illusion of separateness comes from the perception of things being in various different states, such as dense matter or liquids or gases, etc. But it's all really one substance in various states of being. Next sentence. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse, the father of all perfection and the whole world is here, its force or power is entire if it be converted into earth. In this context, the sun represents fire, which makes sense as it radiates heat. The moon, symbolically speaking, represents its counterpart, which is water, even though it's not wet. Remember, we're talking about symbols here, not literal. So the sun radiates out and is male. The moon is magnetic, is cool, and represents the female. The wind is the element of air, and we're told that it carries something. While invisible to the eyes, one need only think about where the dew that collects on a blade of grass comes from to understand that within the element of air, there can be something else. In this example, water. The earth is its nurse. The earth is also one of the alchemical elements, and we're told that it nurses something likely the same thing that is carried by the air in its belly. So we have four elements, fire, water, air, and earth, and a hint of a fifth element, which is alluded to, but not named. But in the next sentence, we are told about its perfection and force. This concept is expressed in the shape of the Great Pyramid, as well as in some similar pyramids in China, which have the exact same shape and orientation with four base points and a missing elevated top or fifth point, which may or may not have been golden at one point in time. In any event, each of the four elements contain the other elements within them. So while there's at least undetectable trace amounts of moisture in matter, for example, if you were to compress soil, you may get a droplet of water. You could also convert water by heating it and evaporating it into air. And as in the same example of dew, air contains some trace amount of water and can be heated up into a gas or flame. But they all contain the mysterious fifth element as well. And while each element is progressively less dense from earth to water to air to fire, the fifth element is the most subtle of them all, called ether in alchemical chemistry and early physics. It was believed to fill the universe, and while modern academia claims to have debunked the concept, the belief in ether as an element was held by medieval alchemists, ancient Greeks, Buddhists, Hindus, the Japanese, and Tibetans. Next sentence. Separate thou the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, sweetly with great industry, it ascends from the earth to the heaven, and again it descends to the earth, and receives the force of things superior and inferior. We already touched on this a bit, and it speaks to the distillation we see medieval alchemists engaged in, with all their glass beacons and ovens, where they appear to be refining, mixing, heating, and distilling liquids, trying to isolate this fifth element, which is also known as quintessence and is so fine and is so subtle that it's considered a psychic spiritual energy superior to the other four elements and is so elusive that modern machines are not sensitive enough to measure it and may only detect it indirectly. This is what is also known in Asia as Qi or Qi, what Wilhelm Reich called Orgone and tried to amplify with his Orgone box a device whose effects were also related to the shape of the pyramid, 
a topic I covered in a video on monoatomic gold that was unfortunately removed. It is also called prana in places like India, and in esoteric communities of Germany, it was called vril, the title of one of my books. Vril, or quintessence, or if you prefer prana, or chi, or ki, was said to heal any disease or condition and to have the seemingly magical ability to rejuvenate the body. But as incredible as that sounds, it's only scratching the surface, and it's only here where this presentation really starts. Next sentence. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world, and thereby all obscurity shall fly from you. Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So was the world created. From this are and do come admirable adaptations, whereof the means is here in this. This part gets a bit controversial, and there's a reason this material is taught on a gradient, step by step, over a period of time. And I'm only presenting an introduction of a small portion here, so it's to be expected that many will not resonate with what I say next, but I'll still offer this to you and show those interested where they can find a deeper explanation than I will be giving here. The human being is a composite being. While there are solid bones, there's also liquid blood, and as long as there's life, there's circulating air or breath. But if we're to believe Toth the Atlantean, then as above, so below, implies that all elements are contained within, including the subtle ones, namely fire and quintessence. While the physical matter requires physical nourishment to grow and be sustained, the subtle energetic bodies need nourishment as well. Such can be derived from art, music, love, and things that are not physical, not measurable by scientific instruments, yet still exist and are considered very real and equally as vital. So as the physical body is like an alchemical machine that transmutes the food and water you eat and drink into protein and other vitamins that it then reconstructs into new tissues and blood, the mind or spirit also transmute mentally and emotionally. It's not the purpose of this video to prove these things to you, only to expose them to you for your consideration. In occult philosophy, meaning the ancient mystery school religions, which whether you're aware of it or not, are also part of the modern mainstream religions, only hidden, or in many cases altered and aberrated, there is as a primal goal the development of the soul. Now I'm aware that many religious people will insist that their soul is already fully developed and functioning, and all one needs to do is believe in a certain sentence, or recite the sentence out loud, such as I believe such and such, is my Lord and Savior, click their heels together three times, and like magic, all sins are forgiven and washed away, and after their body expires, they experience eternal bliss, no questions asked. And I'm not going to argue with anybody. If that's your position, so be it. I'm not going to try to convert you or ask you to join any organization. I merely want to share what the ancients believed, and it's not normally divulged publicly as perhaps it should be. The ancient civilizations that dealt in what we call alchemy, whether it be ancient Egypt, Greece, India, China, Europe, or the New World, all believed that, spiritually speaking, humanity had somehow fallen from a previously higher state of being, and this was expressed in various different ways. But what was universal was the idea that mankind rather than mutating from primitive apes into some sort of great modern pinnacle, has been degraded and degenerated, has lost its way, so to speak, and rather than evolving, has devolved. The occult tradition, in its original form, was an attempt to redeem oneself, to rise back up into a higher spiritual state. And this is the basis for pre-Christian metaphors relating to rebirth, resurrection, or a phoenix rising from the ashes, and so forth. It was believed that the human potential was much higher than the current scientific understanding of it, and that through what has become labeled as sinful behavior, 
this potential is no longer realized. Now, when I say sin, I'm not speaking about being judged by an external deity that punishes you, but sin as defined as an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law is also an ancient Mesopotamian moon god or goddess, which had also become associated with the planet Venus and goddess in general. But I want to keep this simple and to the point, which involves the appropriate management of one's vital energies, which when wasted or expelled in a frivolous manner, which is also denounced as one of the Ten Commandments, results in a loss of vitality, and not so much in a physical sense, but as a spiritual potential. Unfortunately, I can't be much more specific on this platform, but I have several other videos I made on this subject, and I'll give three references on this topic and encourage further research for those interested. The first is Samuel Un Wyor, a Colombian author of many books on esoteric spirituality which have been translated into many languages, and most are available online for free. I can't say that I agree with everything he says, but his main thesis is close enough to what the ancients taught that I can recommend his general ideas to you. Another author is Montauk Chia, a Taoist master who has a different approach, different techniques, as he teaches an esoteric version of Gigong, but in terms of experience, the similarities in philosophies and results become apparent. The third is Heinrich Arnold Krum Heller, a doctor, German naval intelligence agent, Rosicrucian, and author, who's not very well known, but published some very guarded secrets and so deserves mention. A lot of his material is copied and regurgitated by other authors who watered it down or altered it too much to be of much value. Which brings us to the last sentence of this brief excerpt. Hence, I am called Hermes Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. There can be numerous ways to interpret this, and I will focus on the one that I feel is most important to the context of this presentation. The goal of internal alchemy, as opposed to the physical practice of turning lead into gold, is the development of spiritual gold, which is the soul. The ancient Egyptians were concerned with the afterlife, with acquiring, developing, and enhancing a vehicle to survive the passing of the physical vehicle or body. They wanted to nourish the soul and give the consciousness, the real you, the ability to achieve spiritual immortality rather than simply continuing the cycle of what Buddhists call reincarnation. To end this cycle of birth and death, the ancients believed that the soul must be pure enough, strong enough, and cannot be energetically depleted by sinful activity, as I've briefly touched upon. The reason the god of wisdom, Hermes or Thoth, is called three times great is because it references the three parts of man, the body, mind, and soul, and neither aspect of the three parts can be neglected or degraded. This is why I can't endorse someone like Aleister Crowley, who promoted drug use and other degenerative acts, which may or may not provide a temporary positive effect, but will ultimately lead one away from the desired outcome, in my opinion. One should avoid smoking, excessive drinking, drugs, porn, and any activity that compromises one's integrity, and especially wasting of the vital energy through sinful activity, which does not mean evil, it just means performed improperly. This does not mean one should be abstinent, as there's more than one way to perform the act. It also does not mean one should not have kids, as there's 365 days in a year, and how many of those days does one need to spend spilling the cup of Hermes, so to speak, to make kids. If you have 10 wives and create 10 babies a year, that leaves 355 days of the year left, right? You could make 10 babies a year with 10 different women if you wish and have 355 days left over for retaining your vitality for other purposes other than procreation. So please don't say that this practice means sacrificing procreation somehow which is just a justification of an addict. 
that is frightened at the concept of giving up their addiction. If you only knew the exponential bliss that was available by not eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge, which incidentally is a metaphor for coitus, you would gladly consider the alternative way of performing the act. When Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi or fig tree, don't think he sat there with his eyes shut taking a nap, which is the modern view of meditation, as the tree was symbolic for the sacred act. So I'm not saying the key is abstinence at all, quite the opposite. It must be learned, take some discipline, but the rewards are worth it, at least according to the ancients, such as emperors, philosophers, alchemists, people like Nikola Tesla, Gandhi, Socrates, Leonardo da Vinci, the Dalai Lama, Plato, and many others. To enter the mystery school of Pythagoras required 40 days of fasting, and this did not mean refraining from food for 40 days, but abstaining from spilling the cup of Hermes, a practice familiar to many modern athletes who refrain before a big fight, as this gives them what they perceive to be a competitive edge. That same energy is what is harnessed for spiritual development, not just athletic performance. The last sentence speaks of the operation of the sun and is the true mystery behind why the pharaohs were considered sun gods and why they expected to live on in a godlike, immortal state in the astral realm after the bodies expired. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift and is the best way to support my work. I would like to thank those who support me through Atlantean Gardens on Patreon. I greatly appreciate it. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I would also like to thank anyone that shares these videos as I rely on word of mouth. Please remember to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for updates. And as always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. Please have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you again soon.